Welcome. So I'm Larry Calvert. I hold the R. Chad Dreyer Chair in Accounting Ethics. I want to thank some people before we get started. I want to thank Nancy Donovan and all of her students. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank Natalie Durdeck for her uh, publicity on the program. I don't think she's here tonight, but we'll still, yeah. And I want to thank Chad and uh, Jenny Dreyer uh, for their for, for me being here. So they set up this chair in accounting ethics and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, sadly, Chad Dreyer passed away uh, during this past year, so we'll miss him, but we'll remember him. And I wanna thank the, Internet, the Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability under which this program uh, now resides. So it's a great place. So I wanna give a brief introduction to our speaker tonight. It's gonna be very exciting because we're going to be talking about sustainability and ESG stuff, and if we don't know what any of that means, we will by the end of the next hour. I also want to mention that we're going to have some Q&A. By 8.30, we'll get out and have some refreshments and be able to talk uh, out in the lobby. So Robert Hurth, Jr. is our speaker tonight. Bob is a Senior Managing Director at Protivity, a global internet internal audit and business risk consulting firm that operates in 22 countries. Prior to that, he was Executive Vice President, Global Internal Audit, and a member of the firm's six-person executive management team for the first 10 years of Protivity's development. He's a co-vice chair of the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, SASB, and the sector chair for technology and communications. He's the chairman emeritus of the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission, most commonly known as COSO. He served as that chair from June 2013 to February 2018. Uh, in 2012, he was appointed to serve a two-year term on the Standing Advisory Group of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, the PCAOB, and was reappointed to serve a three-year term in the December 31, 2016. So for accounting majors, all those acronym things that you've heard, he served on many of those, which is very cool. Bob earned a BBA in accounting from Southern Methodist University started his career in public accounting, became a global equity partner of Arthur Anderson in 1988. During his tenure there, he worked in Dallas, Melbourne, Australia, which is, seems obvious, Dallas to Melbourne, San Jose and San Francisco offices, serving as a partner in both the audit and advisory practices of the firm. For over 20 years, he's practiced as a CPA in Texas and California, and also qualified as a chartered accountant and registered company auditor while working in Australia. Please give a warm welcome to Bob Hurth. Good evening, how are you? Okay, so I know I'm taking up your important whatever time, so hopefully you'll find this uh, interesting. It's great to be here, and Larry, thank you for having me, and Dean, um, when you get older, it's really nice to go back to school because you can call the professors by their first name. It's really fun, so you can't do that. But, but on that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about SASB, but I hope that what you get out of this is some other tidbits um, to help you as a person. So, you know, I might give you some homework, I'm going to give you some opinions, and then you can, you know, ignore what you don't like, but maybe take some of these things on. So when you leave, you know, you learned um, a, a couple new things. But, but SASB is really um, important to me, and I'll, um, I'll explain why. So all those little things that I did, um, at the firm I was with before, I was just average. So, you know, you have to do a lot of things. But it's been great. I've had a great, uh, a great career, and I'm looking forward to doing uh, more of these things around sustainability. So let me, let me begin to talk to you about this. Okay, see how close I got to get. There we go. So my story. So before I tell you my story, I want you to think about your story. So, you know, those of you that are especially graduating, I hope you already have your story figured out. Those of you that um, aren't there yet, you're gonna need to, you're gonna need to have a story. People are gonna so, so tell me about yourself. And they don't want like a 30-second answer. Now, sometimes they want a 30-second answer, but you need to be able to kind of go with yourself and, and have a story, okay? So as you can see, I've got a story. I grew up in, I grew up in Chicago. Um, the Swedish flag is there because I'm kind of Swedish and German, but when I was 12, I um, got shipped away by my parents to Sweden to live with a family and in the countryside where the farmers didn't speak English, so you had to learn Swedish, and that was kind of interesting. And then I, you know, I played some sports. Um, I wasn't the greatest at that, 
but I was in the band, I played tenor sax, and then I ended up going to this school in Texas that at the time, chauvinistically, had a all-male, 96-piece marching jazz band at SMU. So I did that for, for four years, and that was really interesting. And then the German country and flag is up there because um, I was a German major and an accounting major. Now, back then, they didn't kind of let you have double majors because they saw that as you were getting two for the price of one. So I, I had enough credits to be a German major, but I ended up getting my degree in accounting. And I thought, you know, the, the best thing I could do for a summer job would be to have an accounting job in Germany. So I kind of concocted this thing, and I think I got mad at my parents one day because I wanted to do this. And they said, okay, if you figure it out, we'll pay for you to go. So I did that, and that was a great, great learning um, experience for me. And then, um, you know, I graduated when there were eight accounting firms. There are now four. I believe I worked for the greatest accounting firm that ever existed called Arthur Anderson. And I say that because it was truly unique. And for people that know the firm, I hope they would agree. And, you know, we, we can't debate the, the logic of everything. We can debate the fact that the Supreme Court <gasps> unanimously, unanimously overturned the verdict against Arthur Anderson. Um, I didn't spend 15 seconds on Enron, OK? So it's a really interesting story. And actually, some of the history is good. Um, you know, I went to Australia. I went to Australia because that's when I made partner. In the way that our firm back then worked on it, they identified uh, on a global basis who they thought could be a partner. And then they figured out where did they live and was that in the right place. And so I got the, the in red ink on my desk, come see me now, from the audit division head. And he said, the good news is we think you can be a partner. The other news, it will not be here. Because the Dallas office at that time was going through a big recession in the mid-'80s. And it was kind of, we'll figure it out, and you'll figure it out, and it worked out. It was, a, it was a great experience for me, and I know that those of you that do abroad programs, I think that's really important. I would suggest that the real test is go live someplace and work somewhere. So people want to, they want to be, you know, in international business. That's fine. Studying international business isn't going to get there. So, you know, go, go to a, to a uh, company and have the courage to transfer and live there and see what it's like to get paid in that currency and understand that country's uh, healthcare system and, and you know, make friends and acquaintances and contacts and get clients because you're now living there. So that, that to me is a great experience. And then you, know, then you can come back and you really broaden your horizons by having something like that. Um, you know, in 2002, as um, we sort of fondly say, our videotape got cut at, at, as partners and employees of Arthur Anderson. We, we, uh, formed the firm with the funny name, as I call it. And Barb may not know this, and Ricky and Dan, but I was the chairman of the naming committee. So we quickly had to kind of figure out what were we going to be called. And we had this branding firm called SALT. And uh, I met them. They all had you know, black turtlenecks on and black jeans and everything. And we were talking. And they, they, uh, I, I did ask them why they named their firm SALT. They said, well, we, we believe we're the essential ingredient in branding, OK? And uh, so when you, so. I learned a lot from them, though. Say when you, they said, Bob, you know, when you name a firm, you can name a firm three ways. You can name a firm after a person. And we're not think, we don't think Bob Hearth is going to work, so we've got to think of a different name. And um, that's a joke. All right, so, uh, but, uh, but you can also name a, a company that describes what it does. You know, General Motors, right? International business machine. It, it's, you know, Acme Sausage Factory. But then you can also have a suggestive name, you know, like Accenture or Lexus or something like that. And they, they convinced us that we should go with a, a suggestive name. And they sort of asked us, what, what did we value? And we started talking about, well, you know, we came from Arthur Anderson, and we think we were really professional. We felt we were objective. You know, we felt we dealt with integrity and everything. And they kind of put all these words together. So productivity was one of the things that came up. And I, as the chairman of the naming committee, I really liked the three eyes. So we became, became productivity. You heard that I was on the standing advisory group, the SAG, as we call it, to the PCAOB. For those of you that don't know that, that's a regulator that got formed by the government to oversee the accounting profession. Previously, the accounting firms, whether there were eight or six or five or four, all kind of reviewed each other and came to some conclusions about the quality of the audits that were done and, and things like that. And I think because of lots of things, the government felt that the profession was too important for them to be just overseeing themselves, so they created the PCOB, and you could 
look it up if you're not familiar with it and see the things that they do. That was really interesting. Um, and then the, the cube, if you don't not familiar with that, we call that the COSO cube. That is so, supposed to be an entity, and it talks about the fact the way that if you think about internal control, it can cover operations, reporting, or compliance. There's your attitude we call the control environment. Risk assessment is what's important. You can only, you can only focus on so many things because you only have a limited amount of time to different control activities, to how you get information about control and communicate it, and finally, how you monitor it and you see that it works. And the globe there is, as chairman of that, I became chairman when that new model came out and every US stock exchange listed company was gonna to have to change from the old COSA model we had to this one. So we had four or 5,000 companies that were gonna make this change and my job became uh, talking to those companies and traveling around, around the world and then recently I've become involved at SASB and as you heard, I'm the co-vice chair there. We have a chair who's a, a University of Texas professor named Jeff Hales and then uh, my co-vice chair is Verity Chager who's um, a VP at BlackRock, small company, has assets under management of $6.7 trillion. Let me go over that again. $6.7 thousand billion dollars. I'm gonna give you some bigger numbers than that too when you look at that. So that's a little bit about me. So, so I have a story, everybody has a story. So, the, so the, the point here is understand someone's story. Believe me, if you will just take time and you've got all the data out there with LinkedIn and everything else to understand someone's story before you see them you will be so much more effective with them. You'll also have fun, and you'll probably find one or more common interest or points you have, where they grew up, or where they went to school, or what they like to do, you know, or their hobby. So, so you should have a story, and you should take the time to understand other people's story, and it will be way more fun and rewarding. And this story, I'll end tonight with, how I think you need to be thinking about your story, because this is your story, and you, you make your own story, and you make your own, sto own story by, by you doing something, okay? So, my globe. So I've been around the world. I have been to Saudi Arabia twice. This is my friend Saad. I did ask him to get me the headdress, which I have at home, but it doesn't look very good when you're walking around in California wearing it, so. So, you know, when you go to the Middle East, um, and if you studied the Middle East, especially, um, so I've been to, uh, you know, to Kuwait, and I've been to Dubai, I've been to Dubai and Abu Dhabi, I've been to Oman, I've been to Qatar, I've been to Bahrain, um, all those countries, they have a very large expatriate population. As you think about what those countries were and what they've become because of their uh, natural resources, they need a lot of other people to do work. They have a very interesting social system, starts with the royal family, and those royal families then you know, can become you know, hundreds to thousands of people. And remember when you have all the money that you need, they have a system where there are no taxes, so there are no income taxes, there are no property taxes, all of your income is tax-free, tax and they only have a population that might be um, you know, a, a tenth to a fifth of the size that they, that they need. So in some of these countries, 80% of the residents are expatriates and you'll, they will wear Western clothes and you'll be able to tell the locals by them wearing their, their thobes and women wearing burqas and their, the covering of women a lot of times are related to their, um, their devoutness in terms of their religion. And so it's a really interesting um, custom uh, to, to understand and appreciate uh, um, and respect. So it's, so it's interesting because I've been to a lot of those and it's been um, a lot of fun to learn about all those, all those cultures. So, the other thing I want to talk about is, is, is this. And as, you know, I'll give you lots of little ideas. Now, a couple of things. You might not like the way I present, so that's okay. Because the things you don't like, I know you then won't do. And the things that I do do, then maybe you'll emulate. And I would suggest that as you have desires to become leaders in organizations, this will be critical. If you can't do this, you just won't make it because 80 to 90% of your job just becomes communicating. Five people, a thousand people, 20 people, whatever. So maybe you'll get a couple tips on the things to do. But you should sit back. This is going to change over time as you, as, you, as you grow older and things like that. And you got to figure out what's important. What, what, what means things to you? Well, how do you want to prioritize? You know, where do you, 
where do you draw the line? And that, that's up to you. So, you know, what, what role does your family play? What role doesn't play? What, you know, I like riding my bike and I like driving the Mustang, you know? And those are kind of materialistic, but you know, if I didn't ride my bike, I would weigh 300 pounds and I would be totally insane. I, I would, and, 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 and so that's why I ride and I get out there and do my thinking and stuff like that. Um, um, so, so do think about that. What's, what's most important and what, what brings you happiness and joy and, and find ways to um, you know, prioritize that and, and spend your time doing some of those things. Okay, so now let me start to talk about sustainability and ESG. I'll talk a little bit about the, the evolution of it and how it's moved and what, um, what companies are doing. But this whole sustainability thing has morphed into, as Larry said, what we call ESG. So these three, three letters are the environment, social aspects, and, and governance concerns. And you know, if you think about it, so you'll see here sustainability has been going on for a long time, but this is a really good definition. So this definition comes from this report in the late 80s that you know, sustainability is about meeting the development needs we have today, but being able to allow future generations to meet their development needs. So examples, right? We eat fish and we build houses out of wood. Sustainability would say, don't eat all the fish, you know, and probably farm some fish, and then plant some trees after you cut them down, right? So that's sort of the concept. You know, we live in, in, in just a marvelous um, ecosystem, planet, when you think about all of the people we have and plants and animals and everything, it's really interesting. So, so there is a view that, you know, you can do this if you're a little bit thoughtful rather than not being thoughtful. And these are just some definitions that um, SASB uses, and you'll see we're, we're very much about accounting standards and numbers, and I'll give you some examples, but we're, we're about reporting information on sustainability like the FASB and GAAP and financial statements are to reporting information about financial performance. So what's also important to know, you hear a lot about climate, and climate is absolutely the one of, if not sort of the major pressing issue that we find. But what we've looked at and the way this has all kind of morphed, it's, it's, it's one piece of the puzzle. So it's not just how we use natural resources or impact the environment, it's how we uh, treat people and meet their needs, it's how we govern our organization, it's how we look at diversity, it's how we look at sustaining our, our organization as well. So understand, it is things about working conditions and safety in a mine and use of child labor and not just climate, but, you know, but use of water and use of certain natural resources which you might be able to replace with something else. So it's a pretty broad um, topic and we'll talk about why people are so interested in this. So, so this has kind of moved from you know, tree hugging and conservation and things like that to a topic we call CSR, corporate social responsibility. Many of you may have seen companies that report, this is how well we're doing in the community. These are all the things that we do. Here's all our volunteer efforts and things like that. And that's all, all really important. But um, as investors would say, they can't value all those words. Okay, they, they need to use numbers to say, how, how are this company doing on these ESG things and how can I begin to evaluate them and determine if they're worth more or worth less than they are today, or worth more or worth less than maybe another, another company. And you know, if you go back far enough, obviously it started out, you know, here's Teddy Roosevelt, 1905, and what he's talking about is you know, the use of, of resources, and that we gotta use them, but we just can't be robber barons of the, of the planet. So I recognize the right, the, do not recognize the right to waste them or to rob by wasteful use the generations that come out. So that kind of ties in kind of nicely to that, that other definition that came out in 1987. And you know, let's just fast forward a little bit and you know, President Kennedy, so now you know, he's, you know, Teddy's getting to the natural resources. You think about the national parks that got created and all those things. And you know, here's 1963 and you know, we can argue a lot, but we shouldn't argue that we're, we're all breathing the same air and we need to take care of that. And I don't know what the state of you know, air pollution was then and all that, but, but that's sort of, so this has been going along for a while. 
certainly in terms of words. But now what's happened is, so if we begin to look at CSR reporting, and it gets more grand than this. So now, Diageo is a huge, major beverage company, as you can tell. You're probably a customer, right? So, uh, so now what they're looking at is, so they've got, they know they use water to make their product. They've now started to create metrics and reporting about how much water do they use. Um, their, their idea is now that we have the number, should the number be higher or should the number be lower? And they've concluded the number should be lower. So what do they do now to begin to do this? And I think what's kind of interesting, so it says Diageo 2014 Form 20F. Um, certain non-US companies that don't file with, the, they, they file a 20F rather than a 10D, okay? But I think that's interesting. That was actually in their filed document. And we can argue that a lot of companies outside the US are kind of further along than in the US. That's, that's not as important as that we all start doing something. So we kind of move now to this CSR reporting and the use of, of, of metrics and, and numbers. So now why is, why is this important? So, Climate and how you treat people and how you treat suppliers and how you govern have always been important. And investors have always used those topics to look at a company and think about, is it worth more or worth less because of those things. But, but things like climate and things like water usage and human rights and whatever it is, they, they've kind of bubbled up and come up more to the forefront. And you know, things, materiality changes as our values in society change, and these things have always been there, but now they're really kind of front and center. So there's a view, if I kind of use my words, you know, companies that can articulate how these items are impacting them and what they're doing about it are worth more than a company that can't do that because I, we believe as investors over the long term the company that's already thinking about those things has a greater chance of being here and being here you know, longer than a company that hasn't quite figured this out yet. Or once they figure it out, they're going to have to kind of you know, really go fast and they're not going to be very well organized. So this is a really important part. And you know, all of the conservation and um, demonstration that goes on, is, it's really important. And that emotional part is important. But we have a lot of capitalism in our world until this becomes a money issue, right? As much as you don't like that, the meter is not gonna move. But when investors who own the companies, so BlackRock at 6.7 thousand billion dollars, and the way that they have their index funds, they essentially own every single public company that exists. And they're a company that now said, this is important to us to make a complete evaluation and full valuation of you. So if you want to Google Larry Fink BlackRock letter, this was a letter that Larry Fink, the chairman of BlackRock, sent to essentially every single public company saying, this stuff is important for us. We expect you to be addressing it, and we're coming to get the information. So Larry Fink BlackRock letter is really good, and I'll show you another letter that came from another another CEO. So this whole idea now is this is about valuation, evaluation. So that means stock price or what you'd sell the company for. So this has now gotten um, everybody's attention in a good way. You know, this is just, as I say, one piece of the sustainability puzzle, right? And right now this is just about public companies, but how public sector and government organizations work and the emotional parts of all this is, is also really important. So we hope we're just kind of adding to this. So Here's a really good, I think, concise uh, explanation of the E, the S, and the G. So environmental, how a company performs as a steward of the natural environment. Do you use natural resources or not? How much of them do you use? You know, investors will want to say, well, are they, is that in high supply or is it low supply? If you're a, the Coca-Cola bottler somewhere, what if the price of water went up by 10%? What if it went up by 20%? What if you're a Coca-Cola bottler in South Africa where Cape Town said it was gonna run out of water in April of 2018? Is that company worth more or less because of those issues? They've always been using water. So these things now kind of bubble up and become really important. Um, social criteria, um, 
you know, relationships with employers, employees, suppliers, customers, communities, where, where it operates. And so a good example there in SASB is around um, clothing manufacturers, child labor. So a SASB metric would be something like, tell us the number of facilities you have that you buy or people that make your clothing, the percentage of those facilities have been audited to such and such standard by a third party that determines if you've used child labor you know, or not. So those are things. And then governance, that's the one that's really maybe the most um, baked in traditional. And in fact, if you look at the SASB standards, and we'll talk about SASB, of course, you, you wouldn't find very many G items because we've tended to suggest if there's already a standard or reporting that's pretty complete there, then we won't make a standard for that. So we've tried to be cost effective there. So those are the three things related to, uh, to E, S, and G. So, um, so here, so here's Vanguard. This is Bill McNabb, and so he's like the equivalent of Larry Fink, but he's at another company. You know, he's not as big. I think he's only at, you know, um, a couple of thousand, you know, billion AUM assets under management. So, so the whole idea is, you know, um, you know, these important things. You know, in terms of what investors look at, he happens to mention the SASB, so we really. Um, appreciate that, but uh, so this is, you know, people say things nicely, but they really mean something else. So the code here, you know, where he's saying, we believe is incumbent upon all, mar all market participants, investors, boards, and managers like to embrace the disclosure of sustainability risks that bear on a company's long-term value creation process. That means we want the information, we're coming for it, you're gonna give it to us, okay? So so that's another one, And uh, but Larry, Larry Fink's letter is actually really, uh, Really good. All right, and then you know, remember, you, I love lawyers, they're really great people, but you do not want to, yeah, there we go. But, but you want to work with them for your will. Other than that, if you're working with them, you could be in trouble, all right? But, but uh, Jones Day is a, is a big law firm and, um, Wachtell, Lipton, and all the big Skadden Arps and all the firms have been addressing sustainability. So they actually have some good, uh, good writings here. And this is one, I put this one in there because this is probably you know, just a month or, or so old and it's really starting to talk about reporting. And one of the things here is, as we have those CSR reports and the reporting that goes on by companies, they're all kind of different. They're all sort of hodgepodge. It's sort of like presenting financial statements and not having gap. It's said, we had a lot of revenues, we made a lot of money, we did it our way, here's how we calculated it, and we didn't tell you how we calculated it. That's kind of what's been going on in all this um, CSR reporting, okay? There we go. So let me just kind of cover a couple things, so to kind of update you, if you, I have a Google alert, which I probably wish I never had, so I set it up for ESG, and you know, I delete, you know, I don't know, 100 a day and find 10, but it's a really good, another, so another tip, everybody. Unless you're a rocket scientist, the answer is out there in cyberspace, okay? So it is out there. So if you're doing a project, I would set up a Google alert for the title and you'll get all sorts of just great material and you know, your project will be just fantastic. So a couple things. So I think this is the world's largest pension fund is in Japan, okay? And um, they have now told th their the people they've given their money to to invest, that they're gonna pay them fees based upon certain performance measures related to ESG and what they want them to do. So they're really putting that in there. Um, this whole thing, so point two is really about kind of why SASB got started. You can't value companies with words. You need numbers and they need to be comparable and consistent. So we tried to create uh, a way to do that. Um, you know, there also is a view that if you become uh, sustainability oriented in your portfolio, you are diversifying less. So actually you create more risk. So that's kind of an argument. There's some other research that says high ESG performers outperform, a, you know, other lower performing ESG companies. So creating a portfolio that's more focused on ESG high performers would get you a higher return. I think the the other answer says the, the return's about the same, um, but see Morgan Stanley. I'll talk about PRI, that's principles for responsible investment. 
Um, there's a whole new set of jobs out there now around sustainability. So there are, you know, there's chief financial officers and chief executive officers and chief marketing officers and chief human resource officers, and now there's chief sustainability officers in companies. I was at a conference last week, actually in San Diego. There was a chief sustainability officer there for, uh, for MasterCard. There was a new chief sustainability officer. He just got the job. He'd been an attorney at, uh, at MetLife. Um, Microsoft has a guy there who's their chief environmental officer, and that was really interesting. And what Microsoft does is, as people create proposals for projects, and for new products, they're required to um, figure out how much carbon they will produce in that product, and the group helps them, and there's an internal charge they've made for, for the tonnage or pounds of carbon you create to develop that product, and so there's a cost that goes into your project that shows, that has an impact on the return on investment of that project based upon how much carbon you're using. So what it does is it really incents people to come up with new products and projects that are, are carbon light or carbon neutral. So it was a really interesting concept of a company. Um, uh, so I, I didn't have a slide on this, but the SEC has just proposed on it. So it's proposed, nobody's pushed them, to now revise what companies disclose by creating a required topic called human capital, where a company would describe, among other things, how it manages its, its workforce the makeup of its workforce might include, you know, voluntary or involuntary turnover. That proposal is still in the um, uh, open discussion phase. But one of the ideas is that in terms of working with investors, um, remember these acts were created in the 1930s when tangible assets were creating a lot of value. And today we know that's not true. So there's a view that this would help to modernize the disclosure by getting more information to investors around a topic that adds value beyond the tangible assets in a company's um, financial statements, okay? And then, um, you know, all of you are investors, so your advisors might be looking at this. So here's an, this is what I call my seek and avoid study. So this is an investment manager, and they did a study, so, so two things. People that buy, why is this important? People who buy your product will tend to buy your product more if they like the story they hear, and they'll avoid buying your product if they don't like the story that they hear about that. Likewise, people who then, so that's just people who, they buy your stuff, they don't own you. People who own you will do the same thing. If they sort of follow and like your story and the things you're doing, they will seek to invest in you. If they don't like it, they will seek to avoid you. So, Again, this is kind of a, this is sort of related to valuation in that you have more sales, right? But um, it's really interesting because it talks both about buyers of your product as well as people who own, own your company. So here's, and here's sort of the idea of why this is becoming important. So the light gray shows you, so the, the total bar is the, um, what we'll call the market cap of the company. So what is the company worth, right? The share is outstanding times the, the price per share. So that's what it's worth. And, but then if you look at the gray, if, if a company's worth a billion dollars, you know, we used to see that about $800 million of that billion was the hardcore stuff we could find in the financial statements, property, plant, and equipment, and cash, and receivables, and things like that. But today, it's gone way, way down. So there's something that's making this company worth a lot more than the financial statements. I mean, for the accounting majors and for, for Larry and others, you got a question, well, why do we need accounting? That's only covering 16% of, of the value of the company. So, so companies, investors have always known there's more than the financial statements. And what is it, okay? And it's a lot of things. It's the management of the company. Now, some of that management can relate to governance. It's, it's their strategy. It's their product. It's their design. Now, could the design be done by people and maybe getting the right people and keeping the right people? Or as their customers become more international, you think about those things. So, so there's a view that ESG, you know, how you use raw materials, how you treat suppliers, those are, it, it's in that mix. It's not the only thing in the mix. But, so the SEC is saying, if our job is to protect investors, 
and understand the sources of value, and all we're doing is pounding on the gray, we're kind of missing the point. So as I mentioned to the faculty today, um, Jay Clayton, who's the SEC commissioner, seems to really like his idea. And I think that there's a, there's a good chance that there'll be this human capital um, section added. And that, then the question becomes, what do you report? Do you report numbers? Do you report words? And so there's a lot of dialogue going on as to what exactly that would require. And we at SASB are actually kind of involved in that discussion with the SEC as we speak because we think that a framework to create consistency and comparability and using some of the SASB metrics would be a good way to go. Um, so it's also happening, you can feel good, that shareholders are putting forth proposals at companies that deal with environmental and social issues. So you gotta understand the slide. So this shows the percentage of all proposals filed that are related to social and environmental issues. So as a company holds its annual meeting, sometimes shareholders submit proposals, which the company doesn't like. So that's a number, but what happens is a lot of those get negotiated away they get yelled and screamed at, they have nasty meetings, they sue people, they do, so that sort of goes down. But it just shows you sort of the level of, uh, of interest that's going on. And I would tell you today at the companies I'm working with, this is kind of like job one at the, at the board level. What do we do about ESG? How do we deal with this? Do we do a lot? Do we do a little? So it's a very um, hot topic right now. So let me just talk, there's now hundreds of companies. So first of all, if you take the S&P 500, the largest 500 companies on US stock exchanges, usually sorted by revenue, about 85% of them have some kind of CSR report, corporate social responsibility, and more and more now are adding ESG items to them. So, you know, go home tonight sometime, right now where you're talking, and find a company and write blankety blank CSR report. It'll take you to the website and look at it. I think you'll actually be really impressed. I mean. Some of these reports are 100 pages long, and they're just outstanding, the effort they've put into that. But, but a couple of these. So above the line, I'll go below the line, are companies we think that do a, a pretty good job of reporting, and they're, they're kind of good examples. Nike, for those of you like, it's just a great report in how they've worked with their athletes and talked about sustainability and the type of materials that are used. And of course, they have um, not an issue, but you know where their product is made and the labor that is used for that product is really, you know, really kind of key. So the child labor um, issue is important. Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, first year they reported, and uh, um, they reported what we call a SASB index sheet. So they had just a, a separate one pager that shows their SASB standards. You might really like JetBlue, and if you Googled, I think 2016 JetBlue SASB report, JetBlue decided to junk all of their other sustainability reporting and just have a standalone. SASB report, and what's nice about that, if you read that report and I asked you, would you like to work at that company, I think you'd say, I sure would. And they do a great job of explaining how important sustainability is to their, um, to their company and how it makes them money. How it makes them money because they now use some software that creates more efficient routes. I told this story to a couple people, but they, they talk about the water tank story. So they, JetBlue studied every single plane that landed over an 18 month period, every single plane, or most every single plane landed with its water tanks more than half full. They obviously don't wanna have any plane run out of water, but they concluded they didn't need to fill the water tanks up all the way. What did that do to their operations? We buy less water. It costs less money. The plane is less heavy. We use less gasoline. That flight, now produces a greater profit than it did by being, in our view, sustainable, right? Being careful about how we use resources. So there's some great stories. I mean, GM does a great job. And again, I think just pick any of these and, and even ones that aren't listed, I think you'll be really impressed. The ones above the line are companies, except for the one on the right, are companies that have concluded, for whatever reason, that ESG factors for them are material enough that they have put that information in their Form 10-K that they filed with the SEC, which means if it's wrong, they're in deep doo-doo, okay? And so that, you know, 
the SEC is about securities law, so the things you're providing is kind of of a legal nature. So they've all felt that's important. Um, you might really like Etsy. So um, Etsy is um, you know a, a, a kind of a marketplace and a, they, sort of a two-sided marketplace. They just put sellers and buyers together. They believe they're a, a technology firm. They take a five percent cut uh, from the from the uh, from the seller. If you can remember, there's a company called Workiva. Uh, I just recorded a webcast with Etsy and Workiva, and the Etsy people tell the story. So if you Google Etsy Workiva um, webcast, it's going to run end of um, October, and they the the financial reporting team will explain why they decided to do this, how they did it. Um, I'll talk about this. They got third-party assurance from their accounting firm, PricewaterhouseCoopers. It's a long story. You won't find their name in there, but you can find their report um, on the website. Um, Bernardo is a, is a large New York City office building real estate company. And the, the REITs seem to really like us because they like the energy thing. They like the energy um, number and the targets. And if they can reduce energy, they make, they make more money. So this is kind of technical. But uh, Bernardo has a really good looking CSI report. They furnished it in what's called a Form 8K to the SEC. And they actually have two third party assurance reports from their auditor, Deloitte. One, on a framework called GRI that gives what we call negative assurance, which the auditor says, I did all this work and nothing came to my attention that the stuff should be changed on the basis that it's been prepared and has been described. And then they actually issued a, um, a formal opinion on the SASB standards that, in our opinion, the SASB stuff presented by the company is fairly presented in all material respects. So those are kind of kind of cool things. That's kind of you know bleeding edge or bleeding edge, but those are some companies. But again, pick a company you like, Google CSR report and see what they say. And usually you'll find SASB and GRI or these sustainability metrics in the back. They usually have a section called performance data. And you can even see if they have a third party report or not. So that's a whole net new area for the accounting firm. So the most important words on this slide is this is not investment advice. So you can't call me up in a couple months and go, Bob, it didn't work out. All right. So, so here's, so the other thing I've learned is the investment business is just a, a huge sales machine. I mean, they are there to get assets under management. And then you know, they want to take care of you, but, but, but be aware of it. So now, you know, the S&P 500, maybe many of you know, it, it's been a pretty high performing index. I mean, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, but if you look at the return of the S&P 500, it's been quite good. And so the S&P company that's created this index fund said, well, we're going to take that same idea, but we're going to cherry pick that group of 500 companies. And within that 500 companies, we're going to pick the ones we think are ESG leaders and keep them in this fund. And we're going to get rid of the other ones. So we're going to have a subset. Now, remember, part of the risk of that is you have a less diversified portfolio. So some people say, oh, you know, do you really want to do that? You're kind of making some, some bets. But they have a view that... Um, that this is going to be something that's going to work and that also people are interested in. Remember, remember, as a consumer or as an investor, I'll seek out places that are kind of doing what I like and I'll avoid the ones that, that don't. So the idea here is maybe some investors, oh, I like what they're doing. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and do that. So this is not um, investment advice, but that's something that's going on. And, and you know, most of the big asset managers now are offering different kinds of ESG funds. They used to be you know, ex um, exclusion funds, so get rid of guns, get rid of tobacco, get rid of alcohol, right? Get rid of all the sins and you know, I'll invest in that. But it's really moved to more of this, how are they focused on addressing these ES and G issues? So a couple things in terms of change and just if we've got to talk, update you today on what's happened. We have more companies adopting this kind of reporting um, the stock exchanges really all around the world have issued guidance. So right now, there's no hard-coded you have to do this other than in the U.S. If something is material, which is a squishy word, you would have to put it in your Form 10-K. Um, COSO, where I was chair, we just issued some guidance of how would you consider these ESG factors when you're doing enterprise risk management-related activities. Um, there have been now some proposals that some people want to mandate ESG reporting for all public companies. That's just still in argument and discussion. Talked about human capital. There's all these new products that are coming out. We've talked about third party assurance and auditing. There are a host of legal considerations in reporting this information and 
where it goes and determining if it's um, material. And so all the law firms are weighing in. Outside of the US, the, the organization that sets the equivalent of US GAAP called IFRS now is looking at what kind of reporting do we want to suggest or require. And then I'll talk about uh, SASB and its, its standards. So what I've really looked at is I think there's really kind of a new, when you look at the risk landscape and what the key risks are, I mean, these are really kind of interesting things. And they all tie, if you think about this, they, they tie in now pretty closely to ESG. So you go back and I'll show you kind of over time. And there's a group called the World Economic Forum. Sometimes you hear them on the news in February, they meet in Switzerland and you know, a bunch of people fly private planes in there. And every year they have a meeting to come up with what are the biggest risk we face on the planet. And so th the left-hand side is, these are the top five in terms of their impact. And then the right-hand side, likelihood, as you can see, they're very E, S, and G, or E um, oriented. If you take what they did over the last number of years, so here's the likelihood and impact from 20, 2008 to 2018. You see how sort of things have changed from just purely economic financial failure, financial crisis, those are the things in blue, you know, to the green in terms of extreme weather, to some of the orange water crises, um, et cetera. So, you know, these things have always been there. They've really now just become more front and center and more important, at least according to the World Economic Forum. I also did a little look here. What's interesting, this is really good information in terms of looking at, you know, what's impacting companies? What, what are the uncertainties they, they face? So I just kind of took a whole series of organizations that lay out um, risks and have risk studies and take a look. I think what's kind of interesting is there's not a lot of correlation right now with the World Economic Forum. So I'm watching to see how these business organizations actually change over time or do they change over time to go ahead and um, move more to some of these ES and G factors. But you might find this slide interesting. And Larry, as I said, everybody can have these slides as long as you don't sell them. And if you find them helpful, you know, that's, that's great. Um, so I mentioned PRI. This is a group of companies so, that have signed up for some principles of responsible investment, and I'll show you what they signed up for. But the, the blue bar is the number of signatories, and the red is the assets under management. So it gets to $60 trillion, so $60,000 billion of assets that these 2,400 companies, in a sense, uh, control, so it's a pretty big group. And what they've all signed up, remembering what Larry Fink has said and Bill McNabb and investors said, you know, we're coming for the information and we want it. And the people that are saying that are also saying, so we signed up for this. We're now gonna consider these um, factors in how we analyze our investments. We're gonna incorporate ESG issues into our policies and practices. We're going to seek appropriate disclosure by the entities in which we invest. So I said, we want the information, we expect it, we're coming for it, we're not gonna be happy um, if we don't get it. And finally, you know, at the end of the day, we're gonna make sure that we're making progress and we're changing course. It's a, it's a pretty, big, uh, pretty big deal and a pretty big group of people. So if you haven't seen this, a couple weeks ago, there's a group called the Business Roundtable. There's 188 companies, about 181. So I know, I know you're doing the math. So which seven didn't respond? You'll have to look that up. Uh, why they didn't respond, you know, I don't know. But what they've sort of, they, I'll give you the, the, the statement they came up with, but there's been this general rule or view that companies are there to benefit the shareholders. And the shareholders benefit by the company keeping its value, preserving its value, or increasing its value. And that's kind of it. Don't give me anything else. There's also a view, if you do these other ESG things, you know, you will ultimately benefit the shareholders. So there's this concept of shareholder primacy. So there's plenty of law firm debate that's going on about this. And what they've signed up for, which is kind of interesting, this is their statement. So they've all, the 181 have said, we embrace this, we believe in this, this is why we now think we're here. And so it's about long-term value and it's about serving a lot of stakeholders of which shareholders are one group. Now, if you read this and if you work at a good company, 
and talk about delivering value to customers, investing in our people, fostering diversity, dealing fairly and ethically with our suppliers, supporting our community, and therefore generating long-term value. Uh, my, my view on this is, it, it's kind of nice that this was formalized, but you know, the companies I work for, they're already there. But it's just kind of interesting, again, that this whole idea of more than the shareholder is a stakeholder that's important to us. Like I said, you know, there's a view that if you, if you do this, the shareholder will be happy. So why not do it, especially when you think about what people are valuing today. And there was a big, uh, big spread. Jamie Dimon from um, J.P. Morgan Chase, guy from the CEO from Johnson & Johnson, and Ginny Romney, the CEO at, uh, at uh, IBM, all weighed in. So there's a big, long set of articles in Fortune magazine that uh, talk about this whole thing. Um, so you know, understanding my background, one of my elephants in the room was, so if this stuff is so important, and that other stuff was so important, being the financial stuff, then why isn't it audited? And so what's really happened, this just within the last, clearly the last year, if just not several months, um, a lot of companies, as I've mentioned, have now all gotten some form of third party assurance. Um, and certain engineering firms for the oil and gas companies and other companies that have greenhouse gas emissions, they can get their greenhouse gas certified by one of those firms, but the accounting firms seem to be doing a lot of this. These are just some examples of some of the companies, not all of them, that get that third party assurance. So again, if you go to a CSR report, and if you went to the CSR report of these companies, most of them you'll find the third party assurance report in that actual report. It varies, varies a little bit. Um, so this is a quick study, it's hard to read, but it came from McKinsey, right? So how can it be wrong? McKinsey's great. But I'll tell you, when you all read stuff, you need to read the fine print. So I got the stuff, oh, this is fantastic. This is great. But you gotta read the fine print to realize that this study is based upon only a population of 50 people. But of course it's McKinsey, okay? So you know, it's maybe pretty good, but, but it's interesting. So, so they just asked these 50 people, do you think sustainability reports should undergo some audit? Just kind of general result. So you see, quite a few of them, of the 50, say, oh yeah, yeah. Then they say, well, let's go further. Do you think those reports should undergo, they're not using all the right words, a full audit similar to a financial audit? So, some said yes, but not as many. So, so interesting idea, you know, that this stuff is important enough that, you know, um, I trust you, but I don't trust you. So get somebody else to tell me who owns you that that stuff is okay, right? So it's kind of, kind of interesting. And that's a pretty new survey. And again, you know, for you and for companies, remember there's customers and employees in a way are a customer of companies. You know, there's a view that companies who can articulate their story that, that many companies think you would rather work for them than, than a company that can't articulate that story or, or doesn't pay, you know, doesn't, doesn't see this as valuable. So again, for companies, remember, there are customers, seek or avoid. There are investors, seek or avoid. And there's a view, it's not just attracting employees, it's also retaining some employees who then hear a story of another company that does the same thing that their company does, but boy, they just seem to be so much more switched on on this stuff. So again, something for you to think about. In fact, as you go to work at companies, is something you could ask about. It's something you could research on their website just to get a feel for what they're, they're doing and saying. So, SASB. We released our standards in final codified form on the London Stock Exchange in November. We did it purposefully on the London Stock Exchange because one of our criticisms is we're a bunch of US people and we're trying to be more global um, and as you see, we have standards for 77 industries. There's some key points here I'll talk about in terms of materiality and financially impactful. Um, so what the heck is SASB? SASB is a private, not-for-profit organization. It can't make you do anything. Uh, Michael Bloomberg was our funder for the first six or eight years of our existence, and we're very grateful for all the financial support he provided. He has moved off of being our chairman now, and um, we have a new chair, but our whole idea is that we want to improve the sustainability disclosures, make, make them better, make them more consistent, and we're really focused on 
let's really just get to the ones that really matter. So investors tell us what, what really does matter and sort of what doesn't. We actually use the materiality definition of the SEC. Let's start to get out of just words. Some words are important and we want explanations, but we need to start to work on metrics like total energy consumed, the percentage of that energy that is renewable. Total water withdrawn, percentage of water withdrawn in water stressed areas, or maybe even percentage of facilities that are below sea level, okay? So we're, we're really into sort of more of the metrics and really fine grained disclosures that are applicable and different from industry to industry. So this is our, what we call our classification scheme. We've taken the world and we've divided it up into 11 sectors. And within those 11 sectors, we have 77 industries. And so there are specific sustainability disclosure standards for each of those industries that have been developed after about six years of speaking to more than 3,000 people. We've had investor working groups and company working groups. And we, we tried to be what I call the, the meat in the sandwich. What do they want? What can they deliver? Let's argue through that, let's do our own research and let's kind of really agree on what's most important. So if you go to the SASB website and click on standards, you ought to be able to, you can put a ticker symbol in for a company, it'll tell you what you map to, you can get the standards, you can download those for free and you can have them. We describe the industry, what's included in it, sort of what it does. We then show just a table of the standards and then we have an area called technical protocols that explains how would you calculate each of those things to get the, uh, the standardization and comparability uh, that we want. So there, there you go. So for each item, the, the top level there, that's kind of the page that just shows you the grid of our, what the topic is, what the metric is, what the unit of measure is, and then we have a coding system so we can organize it numerically. And then, you know, we then explain what we mean by all those terms and how you would calculate that. So, and then activity metrics for normalization, those are things like, disclose how many employees you have or how many facilities you have so we can take a big company and a small company and create you know, per employee numbers or per, per facility numbers and the like. So you might find that kind of interesting. Um, yeah, the whole idea, there is a, about 80% of big companies use a framework called GRI, it's from the Netherlands. It's a very all-encompassing, all-stakeholder framework and we, um, we support that, but we also think that SASB can fit nicely in that um, in that framework. Come on, here we go. Yeah, and so some some companies use GRI, and then they just create a separate SASB sheet, like like Morgan Stanley or um, Goldman Sachs. And so the whole idea is, you're familiar with the left hand side. We want to be the right hand side, and we think by putting those together, we really get what investors want. Um, today, so it really completes the picture. You know? So if you think about it, just having the one side, you don't see all the Mona Lisa. She's in black and white. You get all this information and you know, the real beauty of the company, its financial performance and other things comes to light. What's also important to note is you can't be a crummy company that doesn't make money and is great on ESG and be worth a lot. Okay? So there is a view that you need to also have um, commensurate good financial performance. Right? These are some of the companies that uh, are supporting what we're doing. We have an investor advisory group. The number's now gone up to about uh, 35 trillion, so 35,000 billion dollars of assets that are egging us on and giving us feedback and supporting us and, and trying to do things with us. In some cases, they're actually um, licensing our standards to put in their, their products for commercial use. Um, so remember, I'm the COSO guy, I'm the internal control guy, we have some application guidance and we've concluded, you know, if you're gonna report this stuff, we assume you want it to be accurate. If it's accurate, there's probably some process that gets you the number that might include reviews, et cetera. So we think that you ought to have the same kind of internal controls you have for your financial state information. And in fact, one of the COSO um, sponsors, the Institute of Management Accounts, has written a publication on, so how would you take this COSO material, apply it to sustainability reporting, and we've created a new term, you know, there's ICFR for SOX, internal control over financial reporting. We now have ICSR, internal control over sustainability reporting. So that might be something you'd find interesting. So we think our difference is we start with what's really important, let's get rid of all the stuff that isn't 
let's do it you know, by industry. It's got to be information that's useful for an investor to make a decision. If there's already something that's reported out there and we, we, our research said it's pretty good, we will just adopt that and not make a, make a, new, a new wheel. We have to have evidence that it, that it supports that and, and be market informed. So to kind of wrap up, you know, we live on a rock with 7 billion people. I don't know that anybody intended that there's that many people, but go back to the definition. We gotta live on this rock, we gotta eat, we gotta support ourselves, but there's gotta be something left for people in the future, and of course, hopefully you'd agree that it's the right thing to do. Now, I told you at the beginning, I was gonna give you something at the end about your story. And I said that you, know, you need to make your own story. It is your story and no one else's. And so, this is what I want you to think about. So, it's not whether you succeed or fail. Especially it's not if you fail. It's you have something to motivate you and set a goal and stretch yourself and think about, you know, what kind of person do you want to be? You know, who do you want to be? Not, not, it's just not how much money do you want to make, but what do you want to be? When people say your name, what are they going to say? You know, what do you want to accomplish, right? Believe me. Did I ever think I'd be up here doing this? Heck no, Barb knows me. You know, you know I tried, I mean, I asked questions. I had nothing to lose to call Dave Lansiddle, the chair of COSO, say, what's it like to be the chairman of COSO? And then go through that process, or to call Gene Rogers and say, you know, I know you're looking for board members. Do you want to have lunch? That's great. If you don't, that's okay too. You know, so I'd just like you to think about this. You know, low aim is sin. So think about yourself. Are you setting high goals? You know, are you dreaming? You're, you know, I'm at the end of my career. You're just starting your career. And I would hope that if you, if you start with this in mind, you're going to make great progress. So with that, I thank you very much. And we have time for maybe just a couple of questions. But we'll also have our reception. And I'm glad to talk to you then as well. So thank you. You know, I don't know. I don't know. It's brand. It's a brand new, so I haven't looked at it. Um, I've actually, I've actually bought some ESG funds, but I'm waiting. So, but if you do the back testing, so what they've done is they've done back testing. So how would that portfolio perform? I mean, there's sort of two views right now that there's equivalent performance or there's slightly better performance. I don't think the studies have found that the performance is lagging. So you, you'll have to go look it up on your phone. One you more. Know. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Sure, and you know you sort of have to go back in time. Remember, it's nobody's fault, but we only had certain kinds of technology in the 1800s, right? We only we had to do certain things. You know, we moved, we we invented the electric light, right? That also created a lot of issues. So I think um, companies today are recognizing that you know it's not that they were evil, but what they were doing then is probably not acceptable now, or the right thing to do. So I don't know that they were actually evil companies per se. Now there are probably plenty of examples of evil companies, but I, I think a lot of it is just how much has changed and how our values have changed. Think about our values in dealing with diversity and genders and societal issues that were either ignored or all that stuff was okay, right? So yeah, maybe they were, at the time, I don't know that that was the wrong thing to do, but today it is. So I actually, so I'm sure there are a lot of bad companies 
But I can also tell you there are so many good ones that have recognized the change, that have changed, that are on, on this mission. Get, get some of these CSR reports and look at what they're doing. So in terms of your being out there in the workforce, I mean, ask the question. Now, you have to ask the question in a nice way, right? Nasty questions get nasty answers. So you need to say, you know, can you tell me what you're doing about CSR? How do you feel about it? What else would you like to do? Do you think you can do more? I noticed this. Is that something that you want to get into? You know, th then, then make your own judgments. But I think you've got a, you, have a, you have a lot of opportunity with the job market to, to be kind of selective around that screen of ESG if you want to be. And I hope, ho hope you would want to be. Okay? Good luck. Thanks. So just give me two minutes. One, I just want to thank Bob again for a great day. So uh, all the speakers I have in, I, I try to handpick them and choose them, but I never know them very well. But I would say all of them have just been great people. Uh, Bob has come in today and spent a lot of time with our students and our faculty and then tonight. And uh, the, the biggest test I have for a, a speaker is whether I learned anything. And I learned a lot today from Bob, so I appreciate that very much. And just so you'll remember us, I have a couple of okay. things of swag, okay. LMU College of Business stuff, okay. and a couple more things in the bag. So one more round of applause for Bob. Thanks so much.